So they always say before a big presentation to just imagine everyone in the audience naked. But no one here is naked, right? Yeah. Because clothes are such an essential part of our culture and society, we're all here today covered up with our goodies put away. Clothes are weaved into the very fabric of our daily lives. Yeah, we use them to protest. We use them to attract others. Mm. <laughs> we, use them, <laughs> we use them to gain employment. And yeah, he's that good looking, we had to use it twice. <laughs> and most importantly, we use clothes to help others. Many of us donate our clothes because we intend to meet an apparent need. But what if we were to empirically show you that we can do more harm than good with our good intentions, yeah. that these lifeless, familiar items can very easily be turned into weapons of mass destruction? So when we make reference to these clothes, we're not just talking about fiber and textile material. Mm -hmm. There's a bigger picture. Because clothes stand at the forefront of unsustainable aid, for the purpose of this talk, clothes represents the greater body of detrimental aid. It represents the millions of tons of rice and beans and shoes shipped off to various communities. We'll illustrate this dilemma through a country that lies less than 500 miles away. Haiti, the most economically impoverished nation in the Western Hemisphere, is most acquainted with these practices. Nicknamed the Republic of NGOs with well over 10,000 non-governmental organizations. Yeah. The second highest per capita in the world. Haiti doesn't lack good intention people. But many of these good intention people, however, have unwittingly participated in a vicious cycle of aid that inhibits the growth and the development of the Haitian society. So, our goal today is to unearth the fundamental errors of our giving practices and to introduce a holistic approach to aid. Now, perhaps you're sitting in your seat wondering, what qualifies these two oh-so-fine <laughs> minority women to be speaking about such a crucial topic? First and foremost, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and to the latter, we still have much to learn, but we want to share with you what we've gleaned thus far through our journey and offer a concrete example of what sustainable development looks like. Yeah. While undergrads at the University of Florida, Bertrand and I co-founded a 501c3 nonprofit organization called Projects for Haiti, P for H. <laughs> we, <laughs> we had a burning desire to see change in Haiti, and if our passion and commitment wasn't enough, the fact that I was from Nicaragua and Bertrand was from Haiti, the two economically poorest nations in the Western Hemisphere, only confirmed to us that we would be advocates for the third world. Definitely. And so, throughout our time in Haiti, we've discovered that the popular notion of aid has three fatal tendencies. Number one, it fails to tap into the potential of those being helped. Number two, it feeds into the American drive-through syndrome. Mm -hmm. And number three, it focuses on inappropriate stages of a country's development. Now, allow us to elaborate and illustrate these three points for a second. Instead of uh, providing practical tools, resources, and trainings, we continue to bombard societies and cultures and communities with our old clothes, our, our hand-me-downs, mm -hmm. focusing on the immediate temporal need as opposed to the deep-rooted need. Right. You see, we, we all know this proverb, so help me out for a second. Give a man a fish, he eats for a day. But teach a man to fish, he eats for a? Exactly. You see, when we're trained, we get tapped into our potential and the possibilities, huh, they become endless. Next, it feeds into the drive through syndrome that we have in America. For us, time is money and money is time. Uh -huh. So let's look at some of the symptoms of the drive through syndrome. We have drive through restaurants, drive through banks, chapels, ERs, and my personal favorite, funeral homes. <laughs> this mentality bleeds into the way that we approach aid. Yeah. We want to see results, and we want to see them now. So giving a homeless child a shirt becomes more appealing than teaching him a trade. And finally, it focuses on inappropriate stages of a country's development. Dr. Brian Ficker and Steve Corbett, professors at Covenant College in Chattanooga, Tennessee, lay out three stages of aid in their book, When Helping Hurts. Relief happens right after a disaster. And so we send the rice and the beans and the shoes and the other pertinent material in order to help people survive the aftermaths of a disaster. Rehabilitation happens when we help build or rebuild civil systems, uh, schools, offices, buildings, homes, and other structures like that. 
Development happens when we help further sustain and develop systems that are already in place, creating independence and sustainability, also known as sustainable development. Now, we often assume relief as the most crucial part to delivering aid, when in many cases it can often be skipped and we can move directly into rehabilitation or development. Yeah. Staying in a constant state of relief or even rehabilitation only inhibits the growth of capable-bodied individuals and creates a savior complex for those coming with aid. Yeah. So with these three tendencies in mind, we'd like to delve deeper into our journey to sustainable development. Today, Projects for Haiti operates off of a definition of sustainability that emphasizes human capacity building. But this hasn't always been our practice. In 2011, as our first big mission, Chris and I organized a team of 19 UF students to go to Cap Haitien, Cap Haitian, and this was our empire. Now, these images probably look a little bit familiar to you all because we participated in the unsustainable aid we made reference to earlier. These are our pictures taken in our apartment for, actually, that's Priscilla's little curly head right there <laughs> sitting in the corner. For months leading up to this trip, we were collecting old goods our, our poor, poor roommates. <laughs> and by the time we were ready to go out to Haiti, we had clothes and clothes galore. We had every size, every color, every shape, every, everything you could ever imagine. And let me tell you, Goodwill had nothing on us. <laughs> so after our first trip as a nonprofit, we knew two things. One, you can successfully fit 19 people in a 12 passenger van if you played Tetris before. <laughs> and two, we could do better. We had to do better. Despite our good intentions, we had contributed to one of the biggest hindrances in Haiti's advancement. Ketia Pierre-Louis, a local businesswoman and affiliate of the Croix de Bouquet Chamber of Commerce says, Haiti has practically become a trash can where everything people in other countries don't need comes here. After having several conversations with our partners in Haiti, we became compelled to dig deeper yeah. as a nonprofit and to meet people where they were instead of where we assumed them to be. We met tailors who essentially lost jobs because of our work, vendors who lost customers, I mean, who can really compete with free. We were giving handouts instead of hand ups, all because we assumed Haiti to be in its relief stage which it wasn't. Right, so I'm sitting in Haiti under this mango tree, which by the way, those are the juiciest mangoes you will ever eat. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sitting with my dear friend Frislin, an orphan, and we were talking about our hopes and our dreams, and I shared with him my dream of wanting to partner with educators in Haiti, and he shared with me his dream of wanting to become an honest and successful politician, and how he wanted to help change the nation of Haiti. Well. I had a big aha moment when I realized that I had left him with a sack of clothes, but I had done nothing to help him achieve his goals. So we regrouped. We identified where we had messed up and we began to operate off of a new but simple model of aid. Instead of aid starting in the U.S., it starts in Haiti. We begin with an assessment of a problem and strategic planning with our partners in Haiti. This then leads us into a season of training, building human capacity. Now the purpose and the focus of this building human capacity is really to emphasize the potential of each professional in attendance. Through this training, we then move into an association that is typically birthed from the training. This association has the main purpose of continuing the training even after we've left and come back here to the United States. And so then that, tra that association travels to different parts of Haiti and throughout their community, really advocating for their profession. And then it leads us back into assessing the problem after our contributions, and then the loop goes on and on and on. So this loop ensures that our, our organization is continually assessing our efficacy and our connection to the Haitian community. One of our biggest successes has been within the education sector. And as a second grade teacher, I'm probably a bit biased. <laughs> In 2012, we sat down with six Haitian educators in order to assess tangible problems within the Haitian education system. That day, we learned that of the 65 to 75,000 Haitian educators, over 25% hadn't gone past secondary school, and over 75% weren't adequately trained to be educators. Mm -hmm. Now, this would be a critical problem for any society. 
So together with our, our partners, we began to plan for an educator professional development conference that June. We gathered 60 Haitian educators and we also brought along with us three Haitian Americans and two Americans who desired to participate in mutual capacity building, meaning they delivered the training but had personal and professional development opportunities. After three full days of training in classroom management and procedures, we graduated all 60 Haitian educators. Following the conference, we reviewed the evaluations and began collaboration with our Haitian partners for the next year's conference. In 2013, we brought eight American educators and pre-registered 135 Haitian educators. <laughs> Amazing. Now, the amazing part is these educators actually had collectively over 5,000 students. Yeah. So our influence had widened considerably. After four full days of training and best practices in five subject areas, we successfully graduated all 135 Haitian educators in our ending ceremony. So one of the events that just made this year just so amazing was a guest appearance. Ooh, get it, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that made this year just so amazing was a guest appearance from Justin Metellus, the director of the Ministry of Education of the North. Um, he had heard that there was a conference for the Haitian people, by the Haitian people, and he was eager to take part of it. So you see here in this picture, he's just encouraging the Haitian educators to really go forward and be the best that they could possibly be for the advancement of Haiti. He met us later that evening in order for us to plan for the 2014 Educator um, Conference. Now, as you can probably tell in this picture, Pris and I seem to have forgotten our shoes in the house. Um, we, we like to keep it real. <laughs> so as a result of the uh, training that they received in the conference, 15 Haitian educators decided to get together and form the Teachers Association. Now this is really, ah, oh, it just takes my breath away. This is a team of educators that travels to different parts of Haiti, Saint-Michel, Saint-Marc, different parts of Haiti, hosting four-day conferences for educators who have never received um, training before. As our association travels, they create a network of teacher groups who value collaboration and mutual capacity building. On the first Sunday of every month, these teacher groups meet together in different cities to network and to collaborate. During the meetings, the educators discuss educational challenges within their communities, engage in peer-to-peer -peer learning experiences, and share resources. Following the meetings, the presidents of these groups then meet together in order to share their agendas and plan for future meetings. So we provide the funding and the resources, but they, <laughs> they do everything else. We are thrilled to see them actively advocate for educational collaboration and academic achievement within Haiti. The impacts of our conferences and associations has been phenomenal. Yeah. We receive continuous emails from educators that have gained newfound confidence in their abilities. Now this confidence is directly impacting the thousands of students that they, they teach. Because student teachers are now using student-centered teaching models and collaborative learning structures, students are receiving higher notes in class and experiencing increased levels of engagement. This picture right here is Firenze Francisque. Firenze is the president of the Teachers Association in Haiti. Two years ago, he was a classroom teacher in Capa Isien. After attending our trainings, his pedagogical knowledge increased. And as a result, he is now the director of Le Fondement du Capa Isien, a local primary school in Haiti. Yes. His newly established position allows him the opportunity to lead his teachers effectively and impact the lives of his many students. So as for the future of the Teachers Association, they've been requested by American nonprofits and Haitian teacher groups all over Haiti to go train other teacher groups. And so we're really, we're really just excited to see what's gonna develop of them. There, we know that the potential is, is endless. Um, and so as for the future of our annual teachers conference, together with the director of the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Education of the North, we are going to be planning on registering 405 Haitian educators this year. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Shit, I love it, yes, okay. <laughs> but this year, we're hoping for a guest appearance from the Haitian president. President Martelli, if you're listening, let him know Shelly. Holla at your girl. 
And as for us, we decided to take our experiences within the Haitian education system and bring them into the American education system. In October 2013, we launched a campaign called 10,000 Connected. Through this campaign, we go into Gainesville classrooms and give 50-minute presentations on poverty, sustainable development, and Haiti. Yeah. Our goal is to reach 10,000 students in our community and connect them to Haiti. As of today, in collaboration with the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida and with our P4H staff and interns, we have already reached over 1,500 students. In Gainesville. Yes. Uh, we have some staff and interns with us. What a beautiful, beautiful bunch. Nothing would be possible without, without them. We love you so much. And so as we conclude, we'd like to really uh, highlight the generosity of the American people. After all, nonprofits like Projects for Haiti wouldn't right. exist without it. In 2012 alone, Americans donated over $316 billion to charity, over 7.9 billion hours of community service, and millions of tons of goods. And see, we're not suggesting that these acts of kindness cease or that Americans give less. Right. On the contrary, we're challenging everyone to give more. More time to researching sustainable nonprofits to give our money to. More effort to partnering with those we're wanting to help. And more dedication to challenging our own assumptions so that these good intentions can mature into good and sustainable actions. And as for Haiti, Haiti doesn't need our old clothes. No. Haiti needs a chance to move forward on the feet of its resilient people. As Haitians like to say, Haiti n'a pas avancé. Haiti, we're advancing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.